Good morning. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome you to this session on sustainable museum question mark. Um, this session will be in English. We have uh, five speakers, Diane Dubre, Michael Rother. Uh, we have Jurgen um, Janschetter uh, or um, Knut or Sigurd Somskal uh, presenter. Uh, sorry, I can speak English. <laughs> so who will be presenting the uh, the uh, five uh, speeches today? The choice of sustainability is a theme for the success, uh, success, second successive annual meeting is indicative uh, of its significance to Norway Museums Association. It also reflects a growing demand for action within the global museum community as a whole. Achieving a sustainable future is the most important challenge the global society faces today and in the foreseeable future. Uh, before I introduce the first of our distinguished speakers, I would like to briefly address the definition of sustainability and give some introductory remarks to the session. Henry McGee in his booklet, Museums and Sustainable Development Goals, writes that sustainability in a narrow sense means the ability to last or to continue for a long time. However, it is come to have a broader meaning, weaving connections between the environment, society, and the economy. These are often referred to as the three pillars or dimensions of sustainability. The concept of sustainable development had developed from the Brundtland Commission from 1987, where it was defined as the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This concept has been the subject of criticism based on economic growth at the expense of the environment or that drives inequality and exploits disadvantaged people. It is not sustainable. The growing use or maybe misuse of sustainability too in advertising and political contexts has also drawn criticism and has led to important debates about sustainable futures disappearing down a warren of rabbit holes. The International, International Council of Museums aims to bypass these rabbit holes by focusing on aligning itself and the actions of its members with attaining the 17 goals of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, transforming our world. In 2015, all 193 member states of the United Nations adopted the 2030 Agenda and its 17 goals. It is a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and improve the lives and prospects of everyone everywhere. Agenda 2030's clarion call, leave no one behind, is the ethical imperative of our time and here in Norway, the government has affirmed that the agenda constitutes the political superstructure for the government, government's work nationally and internationally. There's a consensus within the museum family too, that museums have a significant role to play in assisting society in attaining the goals of Agenda 2030. When it takes its inspiration from a developing undergrowth of activism flourishing in the museum sector worldwide, and tapping into the energy and commitment to be found in the global youth movements and in the wisdom of indigenous societies. This inspiration finds its concrete expression in ICOM's resolution from Kyoto in 2019, aligning ICOM's core activities with both the United Nations Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. As such, it is of utmost importance that in the ongoing process of developing a new museum definition, revising the code of ethics, together with developing strategic plans for the coming decade, ICOM imbues these processes with a message found in the resolution from Kyoto. In the words of ICOM's president, museum professionals as stewards of the planet's cultural and natural heritage 
have a duty to engage our communities in generating positive action, promoting respect for all living beings and the earth systems on which the future of the planet depends. While acknowledging that different knowledge practices and worldviews invite disparate emphasis in addressing the Agenda 2030, there's much to commend the view that it should be foundational for a new museum definition, a new code of ethics, and future strategic plans. Moreover, the ethical imperative, leave no one behind, found in Agenda 2030, resonates with the museum sector's own ethical commitments based on its stewardship of the global memory, a stewardship founded on trust and widely shared values. Here it is worth noting that Agenda 2030 has been given a prominent place in the process of concretizing the ethical guidelines for Norway presented to the annual meeting yesterday. This ethical foundation advocates that both in Norway and globally, the museum family have a duty to the public, especially the younger generation, to ensure museums manifest a significant collective impact by activating the whole of its global organization and membership in addressing the goals of the United Nations agenda. A new museum definition, embracing the ethos of leave no one behind and preparing the ground for a carbon neutral world in line with the Paris Agreement is a precondition for a relevant global museum sector in the coming decade and in the years to 2050. In conclusion, I would like to draw your attention to a wonderful book, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. In the preface, Kimura, a mother, scientist, decorated professor, and enrolled member of the citizen Potawatomi nation, uses the metaphor of braiding to illuminate her goal of offering a series of stories illuminating our relationship with the natural world. I would like to suggest that we too, in the museum family, should be looking to make a braid, one woven from three strands, the definition of what a museum should be, our ethical foundation, and the organization's strategic plans for the next decade. Kimura concludes her preface by writing her braid is an intertwining of science, spirit, and story, old stories and new ones, that can be medicine for our broken relationship with the earth, a pharmacopoeia of healing stories that allow us to imagine a different relationship in which people and land a good medicine for each other. A sentiment resonating with optimism for the future, one that could easily be assimilated in a vision for the museum institution for the next decade and the following years. In the words of the Kyoto Resolution, to empowering ourselves, our visitors and our communities through making positive contributions in transforming our world. A sentiment offering us encouragement in the challenging tasks facing us all in the very near future. Before introducing our first speaker, if uh, any of the audience has a comment or a question to one of the speakers, please write them in the question and answer field on the right of your screen. It will be collected and we will invite the speakers to comment after the last speaker. You will also find a number of resources uh, in the question and answer field. I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Dan Dubé. Dan has been working towards the acceleration of the transformation of museums internationally since 2007. She's the founder of We Are Museums, a community of museum professionals acting for the good of people and the planet, and is initiator of various communities, events, and programs guiding museums to change. The floor is yours, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Marianne, and all the team of the Norwegian Museums Association for inviting me today to share my thoughts and my projects on how nature can inspire museums to become more sustainable. So my name is Diane Drubé. I'm, I am the, the founder of We Are Museums, 
We are an international community of museum change makers. Uh, we are producing ongoing conversations and different kind of collective problem solving sessions on the current challenges of museums. One of them is definitely uh, the environmental crisis, but we are also talking about um, ethical movements, about how we can refrain collecting and, and, and different other challenges. <laughs> I am very excited to be here today. It has been a few months so maybe even a year, I think, um, that we are talking about this event. Um, so I'm really, really glad that, that we can finally gather. And I really strongly believe that these kind of gatherings are um, key moments to really share and to reflect on, on, on what is going on in the future of museums, in the present and, and, and about the future of museums. Uh, and, these kind of gatherings are even more crucial today. So thank you for doing this. Um, it is what I also personally have been doing for the past 15 years. Um, I try to gather people, I try to um, invite them to think and reflect and share um, ideas, best practices, challenges. Um, and by gathering all these people, I'm, I'm listening. I'm taking the time to always listen and to discuss. Um, and I try, um, I do my best to do that. I try to inspire museums um, with groundbreaking thinking um, to be able to guide them through the different transformations and the different uh, movement of change. Um, so they can stay relevant today and for the next generations. So um, today I would like to share with you our nature thinking and systems thinking inspired me while um, discussing the future of museums. So just to be clear, <laughs> um, I'm not a scientist or an architect. Um, therefore, I won't be able to go really deep in the biology of things. Um, but I think that together um, we will um, take this as an exercise um, and as a way to train our imagination and try to see the future of museums differently. So I would like to start by telling you a small story shared by one of my good friends a few years ago. And you will see, even if it's a very simple one, this story actually changed the way I look at the world now and, and the way I make uh, my choices. So yeah, let's take a time. Um, Imagine that the effect of climate change made your city polar. Well, I think it's actually not too difficult for you to understand. Um, but yeah, so let, let's imagine um, that you are not used to it um, and you actually start to um, you freeze, you start, you find yourself in a library and you're hopeless to get warm with the state of mind in which our society is today, I believe that your first instinct will be to open the books around you and start peeling them off one page after the other, one book after the other and burn them. You will get warm, definitely. You will feel proud of yourself and you will praise the fire. <laughs> you might also find yourself looking, looking at the flames like everyone loves to do and start um, reflecting on yourself, on the time passing, on the society we are in. I believe that you might as well realize that the Anthropocene actually start to look like the Stone Age, <laughs> seeing you um, with, with this fire. And hour after hours, days after days and maybe even months after months if the library is, is big enough <laughs> you will burn these books but by doing so you will also destroy the only resources of knowledge available just for the sake of meeting your primary needs but let's imagine that the system of thinking of our society was based on nature thinking was based on circularity you will not start to, bur to burn these books. Instead, you will gather all your strengths to be patient. 
you will maybe find another person to get close to and start reading the books to find solutions on how to create heat without destroying anything. Nature evolves at very different speeds than ours, at a very different scale as well. I really like this very simple illustration showing um, evolution of, of humankind and the evolution of a tree. Nature functions in ecosystems and evolves in the long term. I believe that getting inspired by nature can help us to leverage social and environmental change at a local, individual, and at a systemic level and to move towards better futures. So, um, facing more and more crises every year, and yet last year was definitely the proof, um, I really strongly believe that we should start learning from the most resilient system ever. With its 3.8 billion years of research and development, nature should finally be seen as our main mentor today. Of course, celebrating change, shifting paradigms and perspective, this is not easy and this is not really natural for humans. Change is scary, it's difficult, it's heavy. <laughs> um, but if we really want to see the future um, being better, we need to um, we need to embrace really deep change. And these type of transformations require really deep felt changes. And this goes beyond what we have seen over the past several decades. What is key today is finally to embrace change as the only constant in life. Um, different strategies have, have been put in place, um, of course, to how to embrace change, how to innovate. Um, we've seen fundings of um, different kind of innovation. We've seen incubation of new technologies. But with the support for local initiatives to respond to local challenges, I believe that different kind of training to produce or different kind of different ways to consume new labels or certificates, community activism and even uh, global communications to raise awareness on the state of emergency are necessary. So you can see um, on this slide um, a quote that I really, really like and that I feel which is um, very inspiring from Bayo Akomolafe. Um, the times are urgent, let's slow down. So he's basically inviting us to ask ourselves the right questions before going on the highway of progress, um, before going in every direction and trying everything and seeing what works. Um, he basically suggests us to unsettling the models and the values we have been working up, we have been working on um, so far to listen to the land and to the people and to stop looking for the rapture. I think it's good to just take a little bit of time to think about that and, and to slow down. Um, we really need to, to move away from the Anthropocene and to engage with long lasting ecosystems. The world we are in cannot work on a competitive model anymore. The systems ruling our society today are not generating models made to last. We've seen that, and most of you here know that. We know that monoculture, homogenization, efficiency, optimization, these, these are really not um, uh, fertile models. But yeah, I'm sure we all agree on that. However, we are meeting today because embracing um, time, slowing down, embracing change is really not easy. <laughs> um, so I'm listening, like I said, I'm, I'm constantly listening and, and, and talking to people and reflecting. And during one of the meet, one meetup, one online meetup that we organized last year on the online community of We Are Museums, um, Julie Decker, the director of the Anchorage Museum in Alaska, 
said, small demonstrations of actions help to start conversations. And I really like the fact that she doesn't want to change the word. She doesn't want to do something be. She doesn't want to uh, attract all the attention of everyone <laughs> and all the newspaper. She says that small steps, small actions help to start conversations and help to imagine new futures, help to foster more small demonstrations of actions, foster more change. And at one point, because um, each step that you are taking is actually having an effect. It's actually creating this wave of change and this wave of movement. This can lead to something bigger. So in this meetup, she basically explained our museum should really not underestimate their transformative power if they want to if they if they succeed in partnering or supporting the right message. She also underlined that it takes bravery to change systems. Um, and she basically explained like something that happened with her at the Anchorage Museum. Um, so she gave us the example of one exhibition space, um, which was uh, dedicated to temporary exhibitions. So we know temporary exhibitions are amazing resources, financial resources for museums. But she decided to transform the space into an empty space fully available to the local communities so they can organize whatever they want and whatever they need. This, she, she, she said that this was really, really criticized. <laughs> um, she had huge conflict with the board of the museum um, because she basically took away one space potentially available for sponsors, events, temporary exhibitions. But she stays strong, she's very brave, <laughs> and um, she basically explained that valuing the community before the, the financial benefits um, is the journey that she wants to take, because she sees that on the long term, this is having more beneficial effect than any money that you can receive on the short term. So from the individual action to systemic change, we believe um, at We Are Museums that museums have a fundamental role to play by nudging change at a hyper-local levels, as well as inspiring communities to shift, to shift behaviors and even lobbying and pressuring policies. A lot to take on, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I believe that you know, like that's why we're here today. Uh, we believe that we all museum experts and museum professionals believe that museums can create these living spaces where everyone can feel free to learn, to share, to sing, to evolve, to develop, to transform and to act. They are fabulous empowerment machines celebrating polyphony. By becoming agents of positive citizen citizenship, Museums are the heartbeat of our society, essential milestones to build sustainable um, communities. But unfortunately, um, I actually have been yeah, really questioning myself a lot in 2020, but actually even more early 2021, even yeah, just a few months uh, ago because I saw that this vision of museums, even if like I feel that my daily life is surrounded by this kind of museums, empowering change and, and really serving um, local communities, like basically 2020 made, made very clear <clears throat> that this vision of museums is not yet active for many of them. To my mind, 2020 um, has been a phenomenal tipping point for the museum field. We saw most of museums not listening, not taking the time. Um, they were not trying to, to discuss the needs of the visitors and the needs of the local communities. Um, what, I've, what they have done, they, yeah, to my mind, <laughs> they've done nothing expected. 
uh, distancing themselves actually from their audiences by showcasing the collection online, for instance, in empty virtual spaces. Um, I don't want to be too critique, but I feel that, yeah, I was I was um, really surprised by some museums. Um, However, at the same time, and that's why I'm still here today, um, a small but very, very precious number of museums have proven that they can continue their mission of, so of social responsibility, even in the midst of pandemic, even in the midst of a climate crisis, and even um, facing extreme social movements. So yeah, this is clear. Museums are facing a huge identity crisis um, and the need to shift the way they think and do things is crucial if they want to survive. Um, so yeah, on this slide, just wanted to show that I believe that we are, we are really facing a systemic fracture within the museum field. Um, and more time is passing, more crises are happening and more this fracture is deeper. Hopefully more museums are going from one side to another um, and we are here today to support them so they can jump <laughs> um, uh, and to yeah, being able to, to go to the other side. So basically, um, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm good, in, good with time. Basically, I looked at nature to find how museums could embrace more openness, circularity and sustainability. So yeah, that's a nice picture of, of, of an elephant um, because I actually looked at the principle of permeability. So basically permeability allows fluid movement, allows porosity and penetration. Permeability is actually why the African bush elephant can retain water and mud to cope with the arid climate. Thanks to the shape of its skin and the narrow channels between each wrinkle and folds. The approach of permeability, uh, I believe, it can really inspire museums to create a multicultural, multi -purpose, purposes and multifunctions ecosystem by looking at it at three levels, um, three functions, which are very um, interconnected. So, as I said, permeability is about um, allowing movement, allowing fluid to move. It's about porosity and it's about penetration. That's how we can make sure that a surface is permeable. Um, so at a macro level, um, if you uh, if you actually yeah, start to look at these three functions, you see that it's a question of morphism and openness. At a systemic level, um, you see that it's a question of um, porosity and infiltration. At, as at a meso level, it's about the importance of redid, re, redundancy, sorry, <laughs> and, and diversity. Um, you can find Actually, I wrote an article about permeability and museums where I'm, I'm going really deep um, in, in the function and, and like how permeability is working and how this can be applied to museums. But here, I really wanted to, to go deep in the question, uh, in, the, in the idea of redundancy. Um, so we've seen that museums are very, very good at getting inf infiltrated. Um, lately, like that's quite new, definitely. Um, but they have this, yeah, very fascinating capacity of infiltration, uh, opening their doors. Um, but to be part of a sustainable ecosystem, they should compose with redundancy. So systemic redundancy allows resilience, agility, and constant learning. So when we, when you look at nature, diversity and quantity don't make a surface permeable. Diversity and quantity don't make a surface permeable. So um, unsorted and packed mixed of material. So if you think of a soil with some stones inside and different kind of um, nutrients inside, uh, if you see that, that the soil is unsorted and very packed um, with a mix of different material, 
this soil will quickly fill up the space without leaving any freedom for new things to come in. So if it's too packed and unsorted, diversity um, and, and, and quantity, don't leave any space for new things to come in. Therefore, redundancy doesn't go with quantity and difference. It goes with diversity and looseness. Um, so yeah, I hope this is clear. Like you can you can find the, the, the article online. Um, basically, what I wanted to say that nature sings in ecosystems first, pondering the inter interdependency and functionality of each species. Um, you see in this beautiful field of flowers um, that this is a very healthy ecosystem. A healthy ecosystem includes multiple species that serve similar functions or roles. This redundancy is crucial if you want to support long-term stability of the ecosystem. Because we know that natural disturbance can sometimes eliminate entire species and that's normal. But if you have um, different species serving similar functions or similar roles, the entire system will be able to survive to change, will be able to survive to this natural disturbance. Um, so being able, I believe that, yeah, being able to understand one ecosystem and one biodiversity is all about the capacity to adapt to changing conditions and staying locally attuned while celebrating one's individuality and core feature. But this can't be done in silos, um, like how the museums are um, most of the time composed and organized and governed. Uh, it can't be done in departments or within sectors. Um, Again, I'm going back in, in very in yeah to one very inspiring meetup that we had last year on the We Are Museums community, where Yuli Biatrocker, director of the Women's Museum in Denmark, she basically explained us that she sees her museum as an organism, but not as an organization. For her, each employee is a cell working on a different project and making things happen. Um, I won't go deep there again, but if you actually think about what I've just said about this redundancy, about this um, necessity to get to have diversity and looseliness, this necessity to have multiple species serving similar functions and roles, you will find that what Yuli is doing with her museum is very permeable. Um, so yeah, today I would like to call for ecosystem thinking, not only for your museum, but also for the global museum community. If we start thinking about each individual museum as part of a portfolio of powerful agents of change acting for people and the planet, we could start facing crises together and become resilient and very learning institutions. And it is, um, it is this sense of purpose and togetherness that we celebrate um, on the online community of We Are Museums. We take the time to welcome and share, um, and then we find solutions together. Um, but hopefully, at one point, um, I believe that we will start to see more of these strong collaborations, more of this sense of togetherness between museums, and slowly, but I hope fast enough, we will grow to start um, this global movement of museums working towards systemic change. So just quickly, um, this approach um, of systemic, systemic change and system thinking was actually very inspired by the approach taken by EIT Climate Kick, uh, which was uh, which whom we organized a program called Museums Facing Extinction. Um, basically, in their methodology, um, they, um, they, uh, they understand, um, yeah, they, they actually take system thinking to solve very complex challenges, like 
um, climate emergency with very experimental and very impactful approaches. Basically, and this is why I added this slide, um, it this portfolio approach, which really inspired me. So I just want to read one uh, quote from Krzysztof Bielinski from EIT Climate Kick. It is something that he said in, in, in the conference that we organized last year. He said that the, the portfolio approach of um, Climate Kick is going away from the project-based approach by conducting several experiments uh, at the same time, you can lower the risk of failure. If you start to invest all your resources in one project, you really need to be aware of the collapse of the entire transformative pro uh, process if this one doesn't actually uh, work or if it doesn't really meet your expectation. However, if you, in turn, yeah, if you start to uh, if you start to diverse your experiments, if you start to create a portfolio of a project, a portfolio of innovations, a portfolio of, um, of experiments of change, each of these portfolio can start to reinforce each other. Um, and even if some of them are not successful, the entire system can start to be successful. And I'm just yeah, asking you to think again about this beautiful field full of flower and the species um, which are actually having similar role and similar functions. If one species is actually disappearing, it doesn't um, affect the whole system. So I believe that this approach opens an opportunity to identify to identify actors of change, communities and stakeholders to co-design, co-develop, co-owned even, co-host um, change and, and, and innovation. So just to finish, um, just wanted to tell you that it's, uh, it's time to embrace change um, from the fringes and the peripheries to the messy middle and the top of the system, from the individual and the hyperlocal or the collective or the systemic um, action. Each step comes to embrace change uh, because yeah, as we said before, um, change is um, the only constant in life. So we need to start to um, embrace it. <laughs> so thank you. I hope it was not too much um, and I'm fully available if you have any question. Thank you. Diana, um, the next speaker is uh, Michaela Ruta. Uh, Michaela is an architect who had a doctor, PhD in cultural heritage, sustainability for architecture museums. Uh, at present, she's working as a researcher on architectural projects of sustainability at their core, in particular applied to museums and cultural heritage. She developed research projects on more than 100 museums in Italy since 2003. She's a member of ICOM's working group on sustainability and the author of scientific articles and of the book, Museums and Sustainability. Michaela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marian. I'll start uh, with a live presentation and then I'll share my screen later uh, for a PowerPoint presentation. Um, what, uh, uh, first of all, uh, um, thank you very much, dear Hall, for inviting me in this uh, uh, very important collective moment uh, for your Norwegian uh, Museum Association. I'm talking from Torino um, and uh, Italy, and I'm very happy to be here for, to share with you some thoughts uh, and projects uh, and uh, that I'm carrying out uh, in this moment. And uh, in my research, and projects uh, previously also with the Henrich Department of Politecnico di Torino, 
I have deepened uh, how museums can become more sustainable and how does it mean uh, how and what does it mean uh, which is their role for people and for the planet uh, and helping the process developing a series of methodologies uh, uh, and practices the number of uh, museums uh, uh, dedicated to sustainable development uh, concerning also different uh, aspects uh, is increasing rapidly and uh, curiously, many museums uh, are still um, seen uh, uh, by, by people as static uh, places. Uh, um, we can say sleeping giants, <laughs> when in fact uh, it's uh, really the opposite. But uh, we all know that there's, there are a lot of things uh, that uh, can be improved and uh, achieved at the level of the single institutions and in terms, uh, in terms of systemic change to generate impact. I recall here the Heiko motto, museums have no borders and at the international, national, local level. Uh, so um, I think that for a sustainable future, we really uh, need a cooperation also, as Diana said, uh, more than competition. We have um, we need a mind shift and uh, we are all part of an ecosystem participating to improve uh, how culture and museums can, can uh, become more sustainable at the same time we recognize that we need culture to create a path for the change and the transition that we are facing uh, as society nowadays Agenda 2030, but not only asks that all the parts of the society and institutions contribute. Now, there is no longer any doubt that uh, museums not only have the opportunity, but must deal with sustainable development. And there are many connections between the pillars of sustainability, the SDGs uh, and uh, the activities of museums. Uh, many cultural actors have uh, promoting culture as a fourth pillar or dimension of sustainable development. <laughs> Element, uh, which is closely <coughs> sorry uh, <coughs> sorry I don't know <coughs> which is closely interconnected with the other three pillars that we all know economic social and environment and is also a precondition to successfully achieve the various SDGs. My assumption uh, is that sustainability is, is sustainability has to be considered in an assembled or integrated way of topics, uh, considering and balancing the different uh, domains. As Sarah Sutton uh, um, started to say from the beginning, the leader of sustainable museums, uh, uh, that you can start from a simple, goal, uh, simple actions, but you have to keep in mind all the scenario uh, and the big picture. And before talking about sustainable museums and the meanings uh, and some practices that can be applied, I'd like to put them in perspective with culture and people and the planet. Um, Diana uh, uh, put them in, in perspective with nature and it, it, it was really his, interesting as always. Uh, we met uh, in September and uh, we talked about uh, uh, sustainability. I met Morian every more or less every week uh, for the working group and we share ideas and thoughts about uh, these uh, perspectives and um, what I can say is that the culture uh, culture is a sector that has to be sustainable in itself and at the same time is a vector and the culture shapes how we perceive uh, make sense behave uh, related uh, to change in realities it gives meaning also to our per perception and it brings humanity together through emotions imagination and thoughts and the culture is a highly effective tool to spread knowledge to citizens about uh, why the SDGs are so important for society and also to serve as a vector for uh, implementing all the SDGs. Um, culture creates also value-added uh, solutions also for the post-pandemic period and uh, it's central for storytelling at the community level uh, uh, also provides the language and tools uh, to articulate and express what uh, can sometimes be challenging narratives and to foster a culture-based uh, approach uh, to sustainable development, development 
Many institutions uh, around Europe uh, have been committed to various resolutions uh, and some documents have been proposed. And the process continues and is under construction. construction. One of the last one is the UNESCO Culture 2030 Indicator. And this initiative uh, aims to establish a methodology to demonstrate the role and contribution of culture to the implementation of the SDGs and to help policymakers build a coherent approach and a strong evidence-based narrative. There are 22 indicators, both qualitative and quantitative, divided in four thematic demands environment and resilience, prosperity and livelihood, knowledge and skills, also for the climate change and inclusion and participation. And partnership and uh, gender equality cross all the dimensions. And it's important, it's an important document uh, and it's becoming more popular in different cultural institutions, also in Italy, uh, hoping for an integration with the urban uh, agendas or territorial agendas uh, that are going to be developed uh, throughout Italy. As already mentioned, there's a, the, there's a high commerce resolution number one on sustainability and uh, um, there are other documents that can be taken as references. For example, uh, the One Health approach, the UNESCO Education for Sustainable Development, uh, um, the Global Coalition for the United for Biodiversity and many others. And starting from these resolutions and documents, members, uh, ICOM members uh, and museums professionals uh, um, are developing some projects uh, and uh, I'll uh, give some examples uh, um, about projects that I'm carrying um, out uh, later. But museums also have the opportunity to deal with the contemporary challenges uh, uh, that we are facing as society and many are already doing a lot of work in this perspective. They are really multidisciplinary institution where many activities happen and the collection, exhibition and conservation are only a part of the game, but at the core of the museums and also important for new meaningful activities. Museums are in connection with people and communities and very operate in a great network uh, with public administrations, local stakeholders, uh, professionals, uh, cultural and creative industries, artists, educators, schools and so on. And they make a significant contribution uh, to the, for the role, uh, social role and uh, by dealing with questions that are connected to social cohesion, inclusion and diversity, and even more often now with the colonization. And uh, also they are places for the democratic dialogue. We know that uh, there are many risks now regarding the manipulation of knowledge, of science, uh, history, and even the very concepts of culture uh, are being manipulated. And we can think that uh, Museums are part of the immunity and give access to knowledge, culture, history and heritage, and they can be um, activist uh, entities or bodies uh, in society and in the political and the social system together with others uh, to support uh, the values that are at the core uh, of the European Union. Museums and the cultural sector are, have the potential to contribute to change, participate as facilitator of dialogue between the different actors to address the issues and proposals, solutions to be tested in the different contexts through the lens of art and culture, combining science and digital innovation. And in particular, they can help people to explore desirable futures, empower people to be active and take part uh, in public life, stimulate and help implement real and measurable changes, balancing between top-down approaches and bottom-up uh, points of view, taking into account a plurality of voices uh, around institutions and also regarding climate change change, helping you to understand why climate change is so important um, and uh, how it impacts uh, on our future. There is an ethical imperative set by the Agenda 2030, leave no one behind, and one that should resonate with all uh, the museum's practitioners, and they can share practices uh, and participate 
<laughs> participate in supporting the transition is the, the, the ecological one and uh, they can they can be cultural change makers for the individual and collective behaviors but we all know that the cultural sector and museums uh, have been hardly hit by the pandemic and for museums uh, um, the lockdown and the lack of revenues uh, from uh, tickets, the tourism prices, uh, the inability to carry out uh, exhibition and educational activities uh, took uh, an, to an unprecedented uh, economic crisis. And the uh, crisis that is expected to continue for some time yet. And uh, the crisis has affected the entire uh, also outsourced ecosystem even more um, heavily for consultants, professionals, artists, uh, the ICC system, and uh, a crisis that is a sector that uh, was already weak on different point of views, uh, for example, for the economic and staff resources, for the strategic planning, for social and economic reporting, uh, something that uh, aspects that are really um, uh, important also in the Italian and European context. And uh, um, the pandemic has shown structural criticalities that already present previously in museums, uh, accentuating the phenomena. But to overcome the crisis, they are starting really to rethink themselves. And there are many challenges and opportunities for the future of after the pandemic. They are testing change in the management and governance with the new public public-private partnerships and stakeholders. Uh, for example, um, um, there are many museums that are, they are really rethinking uh, how to work with the industries or the stakeholders that they, they finance the activities, um, such as, uh, for example, the Museum of Children in Milano, who start a project uh, um, for uh, um, sustainable development eco, um, education with uh, together with uh, the firm uh, the, the agency that uh, support uh, the financially all the activities um, and uh, who which is a key player uh, in, in Italy for, for sustainability so uh, just not receiving money but uh, uh, promoting elaborating activities together to involve or engage also the stakeholders in uh, an active way. Another example uh, I'd like to share with you is a, um, not a, cent a cultural center here in Torino, Polo del Novecento. Um, and uh, recently, last week, uh, it was um, uh, won the presence in the World Heritage Canopy of UNESCO, a living platform of innovative strategies and practices that integrate heritage conservation with sustainable development. And now on this uh, UNESCO, UNESCO platform, there are uh, only 11 uh, projects around uh, uh, the world and uh, this one uh, this uh, central um, cultural center in Torino is one of the 11 and uh, he won because uh, is a uh, an inclusive for a, um, the motivation uh, regard the inclusive and multifunctional cultural center in downtown Torino and is a foundation and cultural center dedicated to historical, social, and economic and cultural research of the 20th century. And uh, the center contains a museum, a library, cinema, performing arts, spaces, and archives. And the center was born uh, out uh, of a private public partnership between three major partners and 22 smaller institutions. So, and the model of the Polo del Novecento proposes collaboration as a solution for institutional and cultural fragmentation, which forms the core of a new ecology of creative cultural systems and put community at the core of the contemporary use of historical buildings. So, so many, many uh, things together. And uh, uh, we hope also to see a change 
from blockbuster exhibitions to activities for the communities. A strong presence uh, also on uh, uh, digital, uh, strong digital presence. Uh, um, and um, we have seen uh, an increasing presence uh, during the, the first lockdown. Uh, and uh, new digital language, uh, uh, languages are under construction in this uh, very moment. And uh, they are also thinking both uh, on site and uh, online activities with different ways uh, and uh, objectives. Museums uh, really should incorporate sustainability into internal external practices and education programming, and uh, at the same time, empower themselves, visitors, and communities through making positive contribution for the SDGs. And uh, um, they can contribute to many targets, starting also from the goal 11, make cities and human settlement inclusive, safe, accessible, resilient and sustainable. Um, I share with you some slides now. Here. Here we are. Because when we speak uh, about sustainability museums, we need to hold together many aspects uh, and many activities uh, can be carried out. And uh, sustainability has to be faced, considered, the, considering the four pillars, and uh, it's really a multi scenario approach. And even if we have the official framework uh, of uh, revolution say tools uh, that I mentioned before, uh, like Agenda, UNESCO 2030, and there are most the, these are most of all general documents uh, uh, at the system level for the administration, uh, uh, but uh, it's necessary to elaborate tools, uh, guidelines, and documents declined for the different typology and uh, for museums to be applied. And this is uh, what I've done uh, with the book uh, that Maureen mentioned, uh, Museum and uh, Sustainability, uh, that aims to increase uh, the awareness and professional tools in this contest, uh, orienting technical skills in relation to the many activities and providing support uh, for directors, staff, or practitioners, uh, for uh, sustainable or green management, uh, uh, we can say for the operational and maintenance and in case of retrofitting, to start really a path towards sustainability and uh, there is uh, there are also a lot of examples uh, on um, how the theory can be applied and um, there are uh, many topics um, and uh, related to governance and management the building and the energy efficiency efficiency the areas and facilities with a reference to comfort and well-being for the occupants and also um, uh, topics related to collection and the, the exhibitions, uh, the connection with the audience and people and local communities, uh, and uh, the um, connection with uh, the territory, the urban landscape, uh, and the widespread cultural and natural heritage. And in general, uh, the previous mention of the new social role and uh, responsibility. Uh, when the um, we have seen uh, and explained, uh, and we all agree that sustainability does not uh, mean only to improve uh, the energy efficiency and to reduce the consumption um, or the use of resources and materials, even if, uh, if they are key points uh, for the environment, but uh, it involves a change of paradigm in many integrated issues. Um, we, I, I do just a few examples uh, re um, regarding concerning uh, governance, uh, um, the building, uh, and uh, the idea of the extended museums. Uh, for governance, uh, 
and management uh, uh, to start a path. Uh, it's a matter of organizing a sustainable management uh, or uh, that balance uh, the different aspects of sustainability uh, or uh, we can say green management for the current operation and maintenance uh, and in case of projects of improvement, uh, retrofitting to suggest uh, a range of possible approaches in connection with communities and the territory. And uh, it's necessary to explicit commitment uh, written in the mission of the museum and uh, I want to highlight the importance to set goals and targets with a strategic planning uh, with economic and human uh, resources dedicated to specific activities uh, and uh, really important starting also from uh, audit uh, service uh, and uh, analysis of the current situations uh, uh, to set uh, um, real priorities uh, and uh, even underline the critical points uh, that have also to be reported in an annual sustainability, um, sustainability annual report. A practice that very few museums are doing at the moment, uh, but strategic to set improvements and inform also the community and and its stakeholders. Uh, we have to consider a circular economic uh, approach, or maybe better, a regenerative uh, uh, economic <laughs> approach, um, where for the economic model, uh, the main measure of success cannot be exponential increase uh, of uh, health of new things, uh, or even new expansions of buildings or broadcaster exhibitions. We must seek circular path to develop with communities. And on this subject, we need more guidelines uh, and protocols and uh, we can work together for improvement. I know that um, we are museums, uh, Diana are doing a lot on this subject. I'm writing now uh, an article and uh, I'm started I'm starting I've started to map uh, the Italian museums involved in uh, circular economy and maybe we can uh, discuss uh, and do a job together to propose some guidelines uh, um, together. Um, it's a way to share experience and this practice around this 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 topic we uh, have um, I, I want to say something about uh, museum building because it's a big big uh, um, hat under uh, um, and we have uh, many topics uh, uh, related to accessibility safe and security and uh, the main topic post-carbon building, but we know that many, many museums, uh, most of all in Italy and in Europe, are in ancient buildings, so there are uh, strategic uh, activities uh, and uh, projects that uh, can be um, set and analyzed before uh, the intervention. Also not all the um, installations and systems can be uh, put in these ancient buildings. So uh, it's really important uh, um, starting from uh, um, analysis of the status quo. For example, we have developed this green facility building for the knowledge of the building uh, for in the energy system and areas to measure the performance of the building and the system and to start projects of retrofitting. Uh, we have done a lot of energy audits and also it's really important the indoor environmental monitoring, but under this uh, um, head of the museum building, we know that there are also um, activities to reduce the waste, uh, reduce the use of materials, uh, um, water and um, uh, energy efficiency, less toxic collections, care uh, and exhibitions. And uh, um, just a few examples of this green facility board, uh, uh, green facility report. Um, with the analysis of different topics uh, from the building envelope, energy system, safety and security, uh, comfort and indoor environmental quality, spaces and exhibitions, collection care, and measure of the performance for post-carbon building and sustainable action for the operational maintenance and to start green retrofitting. These are uh, examples of the boards uh, inside uh, the Green Facility Report of the museum uh, here in Italy uh, with the graphs, maps, the drawings, uh, um, and the text to underline critical points uh, and uh, uh, priorities. 
really important also the activities of the indoor environmental monitoring uh, never <laughs> estimate this, uh, this activity because we know also that we have to enlarge, we have the opportunity to enlarge the parameters for temperature and the year, um, in humidity uh, to um, decrease uh, the use of energy uh, for the for the for the building for the system so it's a way to uh, become more sustainable and uh, energy efficient it's uh, Another topic that I want to underline is related to the area, the spaces of the museum and the indoor environmental quality for people. Because uh, um, we, uh, it's a topic, uh, this one of the indoor environmental quality, um, not only for the collection, but also for the people, uh, the audience, the staff. Uh, and in this last very period, uh, it's uh, even more important than before for the question of safety and to create healthier and safer spaces. Uh, and uh, to the classic parameters, uh, uh, such as comfort, air quality, um, temperature, humidity, uh, lighting uh, uh, or sound, there are others uh, um, that uh, um, influence, increase uh, the well-being of the So there are other aspects that have been integrated, such as the well-being, including mental well-being or uh, uh, nutrition and movement for the people. More attention uh, is given also to the concept of biophilia and the connection with the natural environment. And we see a really a transition from a sustainability approach, mainly oriented, uh, or, or mainly oriented to the building uh, and its environment environmental energy efficiency to one that focuses uh, on people and their well-being. And we need to also to, con to consider uh, new trends, uh, new uses of spaces, uh, uh, such as um, museums uh, uh, that uh, uh, gives uh, spaces for schooling or for art therapy, uh, or um, a museum in Bergamo, a city really hit by uh, the loss of the pandemic that started uh, started to create uh, um, activities with the communities for uh, uh, um, heart therapy or, and for the well-being for this post-pandemic uh, uh, stress. And uh, um, I put here uh, another example related to the extended museums. Uh, here again, we have many, many topics uh, in connection uh, with sustainable criteria for the outdoor spaces, but also education and outdoor learning uh, or, or uh, museums that are involved uh, with uh, uh, the protection and valorization of natural and cultural landscape. And it's also important here to understand uh, the borders of the the area under the influence of the, of the museums uh, and put in connection uh, with people and the, the communities for participation and activism. Uh, they can be active also for projects to improve biodiversity or mitigation and adaptation to climate change with the natural based solutions project. And uh, uh, they participate in urban regeneration and local sustainable development policies um, or in projects with green uh, mobility and uh, uh, to create partnership and network. I put here some examples, not of scientific museums, so that it's uh, easier to think uh, sustainable uh, can be applied better for uh, uh, scientific museums. But um, here there's an ancient building, La Venaria Reale in Torino, uh, who started this year a new green program through exhibition, gardens and the installation. So there's, there are, um, um, the people are taken also to visit the installations uh, um, and uh, everything is uh, developed uh, the idea to give uh, um, examples uh, of sustainability and uh, green activities also with concert uh, exhibitions uh, and many and conferences 
And uh, uh, another example is the Castello di Rivoli for contemporary art uh, in Torino. And starting from today, it's becoming a, a COVID vaccination center uh, in the space of the exhibitions. I've put here some images. And uh, here another Museo Palazzo Reale where um, with an exhibition of uh, um, street art, uh, um, dedicated to SDGs uh, and uh, there are uh, walls around uh, Torino with um, the SDGs, uh, with pictures and uh, art about SDGs and an exhibition in uh, the ancient building of the Musei Palazzo Re di Palazzo Reale uh, to create a connection about these topics and to spread the message of the SDGs. Uh, just uh, to, to conclude, uh, um, with, a, with a project that is going on in Italy, and uh, it's uh, really a convergence of many practices and systemic uh, innovation. Um, it's a research uh, leading partner is MUSE, Museum of Science uh, in Trento, with partners ICOM Italy and the uh, Association of National Museums, uh, Scientific uh, um, Museums. Uh, uh, I'm just uh, one minute to say that uh, um, I uh, this project uh, is a winner of the call for research for the implementation of the national strategy for sustainable development, and uh, um, we. Uh, Pro the project intends to create a space for discussion, exchange of practices and research with different outcomes on sustainable development between uh, museums. And we have created a network of uh, 30 museums, more or less, uh, working together on a survey with master classes, uh, with uh, laboratories of discussion on different topics. Uh, to create a network that can be um, developed over the years and uh, with uh, different targets in mind. But the last uh, important target is to create also systemic partnerships and alliances at the national and local level for this participation also in policy making strategies. Um, I, I'll give you tomorrow in my presentation, there are more info also related to this museum, uh, uh, integrated museum research project, and uh, um, I, 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 think, I think that I can stop here, maybe we can say something more in the last part in the questions, so thank you very much, bye now. Thank you, uh, Michaela. Um, and our our next speaker is uh, Jürgen Jernstetten. Jürgen grew up in um, 1970s in a politically engaged family, and the fight for Sami rights was at its most intense. The demonstrations against the building of the hydroelectric plant in Alta as a peak. Uh, she uh, was educated uh, both from a Sami handicraft school in Sweden and from the University of Tromsø, where she completed her doctoral thesis in religious studies on the relationship between the Sami people and the homeland. She works as a curator in the Varanga Sami Museum and is currently running a research project on the effects of Norwegian assimilation politics on the local Sami community and how essential the Sami vitalization process has been in this area. She's also a small scale farmer uh, for, she uh, with native breed of sheep and a passionate uh, passionate harvester, <clears throat> especially berry pricking, uh, as well as collecting plants for dyeing her own wool. So, the floor is yours, Jürgen. My name is Jürgen Jansletten, and I'm a curator at the Varia Sami Museum, which is the local museum in the Sami municipality of Unjörga Nesibi. My professional background is within Sami handicrafts, and I also have a doctoral degree in religious studies in the relationship between Sami people and their homelands. I'm also a small scale farmer with a native breed of sheep from which I make traditional handwoven blankets like the ones behind me here. The Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are both about finding the balance between our consumption in accordance with nature's resources, 
as much as about balancing relationships among people and between people and their environment. From an indigenous perspective, this is about understanding the connection between creating something long lasting from uh, natural resources in accordance with local traditions in a community context. It is about balancing resources as well as balancing the human aspects of integrity and participation in social communities. When we speak about sustainability in the Sami languages, the indigenous languages of Northern Europe, there are several terms we use. The main one is from the word for physically carrying something, Godavash. It can be used both for carrying a thing and more abstractly about the capacity to carry something. For example, whether the ice is thick enough to walk on. If we use this image as a metaphor, then we could say that it's about how deeply anchored you are in the ideal of not harvesting more than you need. This is an ideal which might not always be followed, but it's still an example of a cultural value carried by most Sami communities. Another term is sovdalash. It's from the word sovdit, which means to ferry something by boat, or more abstractly, how much use can be tolerated, for instance, how much grazing a field can handle. If you use the boat's ferrying capacity as a metaphor, you could say it's about how you bring along the knowledge you have and transfer it to other circumstances. It is often proclaimed from indigenous peoples that the traditional knowledge could help us deal with the climate crisis. And thus it is important to listen to the elderly and more experienced who have lived through the changes in nature before. An important aspect of the old wisdom is flexibility. In the old days, there were not so many people and Finnmark is not exactly uh, highly densely, uh, densely populated still. Only a few percentages of the resources are privately owned. There has although been an understanding that the rights to use certain resources is in the hands of specific persons or local groups. But this can fluctuate according to their needs over time. And there have been enough areas to make it possible to vary the use. The ideal of flexibility also goes for the livelihoods. If it is important for you to stay in an area where you have connections to people and land, the livelihood can be adjusted to the seasonal change, changes and also fluctuations in resources. Many fishermen in our area combine fishery with farming and carpeting which has been a traditional way of making the most of the resources through the year and through crises due to shifting weather and changes in the amount of fish to catch. Both these two kinds of flexibility are today limited. The land areas are under intense pressure from industry like mining, water and wind, electrical plants and general infrastructure, as well as competing interest from leisure time activities. The official demands connected to the primary industries are all built on the concept of one source of income. Thus, you have to fish a lot of cod to be allowed to fish a, the king crab and so on. This means big investments to take part in fishery, which makes it less flexible. I have been challenged to express some thoughts about indigenous peoples and climate change, but the sustainable development goals have a much broader scope. The SDGs have three main aspects, climate and environment, economical justice and social equality. From a Sami's perspective, it is the totality that matters. We need safe societies built on reciprocal respect without violence and threats. We need to adjust to an ever changing climate. We need livelihoods that makes it possible to live here which are mainly dependent on natural resources, the existential basis of our communities. Without these, the societies where our cultural heritage is kept alive will be threatened. It might be possible to make a so-called green shift in the economy with extensive use of wind and water to build electrical industrial plants. 
the whole county of Finnmark could become one huge windmill industrial area and thus provide Europe with much needed electricity. But that would mean a total destruction of the environment. Such a scenario would not only disrupt the natural biodiversity, it would be disrupt the basis for telling about who we are, we who live here, and the people before us who have been living here for thousands of years. The cultural aspect is not so clearly uttered in the SDGs, and in some ways it might be possible to consider that Sami livelihoods could be sacrificed for the benefits of the society as a whole. But in the same way that natural diversity is essential for the future environment, then the cultural diversity is essential for future societies. It does not matter whether we have saved Europe's energy crisis if it means sacrificing the natural basis for our Sami culture. It's our cultural heritage which is at stake. Our heritage should be carried on to future generations. And our heritage consists of nature, livelihoods and social communities closely intertwined. It's all about cultural sustainability. So the sustainability is about much more than the climate. It's about to, how to create a better future together. For indigenous peoples, this is about how to maintain what is good in our traditions and at the same time take part in the development. Language, handicrafts, livelihoods, local knowledge, values, but maybe most importantly, the pure fact that we can still exist as a people in the future. That our children and grandchildren can experience the environment with our knowledge as a starting point. When the local children already in kindergarten take part in traditional ways of trapping the growth, this delicious bird, it will shape their view of their surroundings. It teaches them to be attentive towards their environment. To be a good trapper, you have to know the habits of the growth, where it likes to eat and when. The children are learning a way to harvest natural resources, which has a local and cultural foundation. Who knows what this knowledge will be worth in 30 years time? Maybe the whole world will be changed economically, socially and climatically in a way that makes the traditional way of harvesting natural resources gain importance for future livelihoods. We have lived through severe crises before. When the German forces were driven by the Russians to flee eastern Finnmark in the fall of 1944, they burnt all buildings that hadn't already been destroyed. In Nesseby, most of the population avoided deportation. They fled to their alternative housing in the mountains. The turf huts used periodically for fishing, hunting and harvesting. And they came down to the settlements as soon as the Germans had left. Not much of material resources were left, but people still knew how to build the traditional turf huts. They had thick walls and needed little firewood for heating. Some had on purpose sunk their boats and dug down their fishing nets so the Germans wouldn't destroy them. Trapping was important as most hunting guns had been handed in. The skills of making your own equipment and tools, of making garments from the slaughtered animals, and of fishing and trapping was what kept people alive. On the pictures of school children in the post-war years, we see that they all have traditional Sami homemade footwear. This had been an unbroken tradition and meant that people were able to go on with their lives. In a Sami perspective, this shows that our knowledge has been of great value, not only for the self-sufficiency, but also for the self-esteem. It is a sustainable practice. I remember the satisfaction I felt when I had finished my first pairs of shoes. From skins I had prepared myself with only salt and bark from the trees. The realization it gave to know that it, if needed, I could make whole outfits from the head to the toes with my own hands, a few tools and no chemicals. This made me appreciate the efforts of my ancestors and understand 
how people could have been living in our harsh climate for thousands of years. What can be made by hand with only a few tools? This intangible knowledge includes many terminologies, words that will become obsolete if we don't continue practicing these skills. From 1851 until 1963, the official politics in Norway towards the indigenous Sami population was focused on assimilation. This was built on the social Darwinistic idea that the Sami had no culture of value for the future and were unable to develop into a civilized society. Thus, the goal was to help us learn Norwegian language and customs. This was done by prohibiting teaching in the Sami language, as well as law enforcement, like the Property Act of 1902, which states that land should only be owned by those who speak Norwegian on a daily basis. This was connected to the construction of Norway as an independent state. The negative impact of the Norwegianization is seen today in that many Sami turned their back on their heritage and try to hide it to be perceived as Norwegians. Their Sami heritage was something they were taught to be ashamed of. It was of no value. This is a global problem for most indigenous peoples, the low self-esteem, the lack of self-respect, which is internalized due to the many experiences with disrespect from authorities that make you feel inferior and worthless. Many indigenous societies struggle with a negative pattern of violence and abuse. For many, this is connected to the lack of opportunities to make a livelihood, which is often connected to the loss of land areas and resources they once could rely on. This means that the traditional knowledge of how to live of the resources is of no longer useful. How to make the best use of an animal for food, clothing, and even the language, customs, and beliefs attached to such traditions. This is not ethnic knowledge in, in itself, but we consider it traditional indigenous knowledge as it has been passed down through generations with the aid of language and skills of living in our natural, natural conditions. It is thus valuable to us as a proof that it is a kind of knowledge worth keeping alive. The colonial school is, schooling system didn't teach the children these important survival skills. Today, the situation is nearly the opposite. After over a century of pre prohibition, where the Sami language was not to be used in public and all elements of Sami culture and knowledge were considered of lesser value than the Norwegian, the slow process of building the self-respect began. Since the 1970s, there has been a struggle to make room for the ways of teaching, for the ways of knowledge that have an origin in the Sami self-subsistence communities. Knowledge that made it possible to live good lives with our language and culture. So we feel the great responsibility to maintain all of that knowledge. Luckily, since the dark age of Norwegianization gave way to the acknowledgement of Sami rights to maintain our culture and way of life, we have gradually begun to build our own institutions and to change the view in the teaching about what kind of knowledge is important for the future. We now have people working in kindergartens and schools who are able to pass on parts of our cultural heritage to future generations. As this is a National Museum Conference, I would like to end my presentation with sharing some thoughts on cultural sustainability from my workplace at the Varyatsami Museum. Currently, we are partners in a research project on harvesting practices in coastal Sami regions. In our case, the focus is on berry picking, especially the most sought after, the cloudberries. Why should the museum engage in such topics, you might ask? Well, the berry picking is one of the ways in which local people engage with their environment. It takes them to familiar places. It reminds them of past incidents. It brings them back to the campfire site they used for the coffee break last year and the previous years with their now deceased parents. It keeps their attention to the landscapes and how they are changing. In the post-war years, cloudberry picking was an important source of income. 
these days it's more of a leisure activity, but nonetheless it keeps the knowledge fresh for future use. Maybe the next generations will have more of their income from harvesting, who knows? The local knowledge connected to these activities are important to carry on, as well as the values conveyed by them. For instance, the concept that only the elderly should harvest the marshes closest to the settlements, and younger people who are fit to walk should go to the marshes further on. Who is an elderly will of course fluctuate in time, and thus the rights to resources are not tied to individuals, but to general concepts of distribution. When we have visitors at the museum, we present our stories that convey our values. Often they include meetings with the underground people who can be helpful or harmful according to your own actions. Our main, main exhibition is a tribute to the May way people since the last ice age have lived their lives based on the abundant resources. They didn't only survive. They made ornaments and artistic expressions thousands of years ago, a sign of creativity. As a Sami museum, we are trying to balance the needs of the local community with the wishes of the tourists. Cultural sustainability is our goal. To manage the cultural heritage, both material and intangible, in a way that ensures that it can be of use and pleasure for future generations. This involves taking care that it is not overexposed to commercialization, with the risk of important cultural values deteriorating. We are part of a living society in constant change. For some people, especially those severely affected by the Norwegianization, we can act like a seed bank, where, we can where they can come and water their damaged roots. For most locals, their roots are quite strong and intact, but we still want to represent a connection to their past and a resource for building a better future. The cultural sustainability is part of the social sustainability, which we try to maintain by being inclusive, making people feel belonging and taking part in social contexts. Besides being a local museum, we also function as a cultural arena for the municipality. We have yearly exhibitions where the children proudly show what they have made in school and kindergarten to their families. And we arrange celebrations and markets where people who ordinarily don't visit museums feel at home. We think the museum stroll as a common meeting ground is of great value. <coughs> the children feel at home in the playroom and the parents and grandparents can enjoy their coffee and waffles. To have sustainable local communities, it is essential that we all can meet and feel that we have something in common. Then we will have the strength to, we need to face the challenges that we have to deal with to make a better future. The motto of the SDGs is leave no one behind. The responsibility lies on all of us. But we all have different experiences to build on and a change for a better future must ensure that equality is not again used as a normative standard for how we should behave. What we want to bring along for the future generations will vary depending on what we considered important in the present. The cultural heritage and traditional knowledge in Varanger will not solve the problems today, but they might be important resources in the future, at least in our part of the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jürgen. <clears throat> Our uh, next speaker is uh, Knut Marcus. Uh, Knut has been uh, the director of the, the Craft Museum since uh, 2016. Uh, he's a, a historian uh, and a curator. Uh, he's previously been a cultural director, journalist, project manager, manager for county municipal plans, and worked at various museums. He's published a number of non-fiction books. He was a member of the Norwegian Working Group on Sustainability in the ICOM uh, Museum Ethic Guidelines. The floor is yours. Hello, I am Knut Markus and I'm director in the Kraftmuseet in Tissedal, Hardanger. And I will tell a bit about how we work with sustainability in our museum. Dealing with um, uh, hydropower, 
uh, as a main theme, Kraftmesser has a natural position in working with climate issues and sustainability. Um, it's easy to think that we are on the green side in a way, working with this uh, very positive energy solution, hydropower, and representing the good guys in a way. Well, that's a trap, of course, and it's a trap uh, that we in the museum always have to be aware of. Um, as a museum, we of course don't represent uh, a hydropower movement or the hydropower industry. Um, we deal with this theme in a hopefully professional manner. And of course, uh, hydropower is not without uh, problems. It's a renewable energy, uh, but it has its uh, cost uh, uh, for the nature, uh, but also for people uh, in different ways. Um, the hydropower history in Norway is a story about a continuous negotiation or battle uh, between preserving the nature uh, and utilize the nature, saving and destroying. It's one of the big battles in Norway, really. Well, now some glimpses of our daily life, uh, the environmental part of it. Uh, we are 18 persons uh, working in the museum um, and uh, we have learned uh, long ago uh, that uh, waste should be thrown in the bin and in the right bin, the paper here, the glass there. Uh, we know that we should not have more heating than uh, necessary in our offices and that we should eat up our food. Uh, this is uh, standard uh, habits, uh, but we have to do more than that. Um, it's different views among us uh, on how we should handle the climate crisis and, uh, and also how urgent the crisis is. Um, we are a lively bunch, it's a colourful bunch uh, also politically um, and it's room for discussion. But uh, some decisions have been made on higher levels uh, with the ICOM resolution in Kyoto as the most concrete document. Uh, the resolution number one on sustainability and the implementation of Agenda 2030. And I guess uh, Morian has already talked uh, about that. You know, it says that all museums have a role to play uh, in shaping and creating a sustainable future. Um, and this the ICOM members have agreed on. Uh, and it's a call for action. The Kyoto uh, conference was in 2019 and we in the museum um, took notice of it and we started a process to follow up the resolution. Uh, our museum was not a milieu fyrton, we didn't have an environmental uh, certification um, like that um, and it would be a natural choice uh, to get a certification like milieu fyrton but we decided uh, to take a different path um, uh, and make our own system. This is often a good thing. Uh, you can get a stronger ownership in the organization uh, and uh, even more enthusiasm that way. Uh, so we organized a working group um, and involved the whole staff in a process that resulted in this milieu guide, our environmental guidelines. It is not a philosophical document, it's most of all a very everyday document with specific rules on how to behave in our organization. Turn off the computer after work, reduce paper printing, local food in the cafe, reduce plane travels, use proper cups and glasses, not those you throw away after you have used them. A lot of this is uh, routines that are easy to introduce in the museum when you first have said that this is how it has to be. Uh, some of the themes takes a bit time to implement, like energy conserving in big buildings and big uh, projects. The guidelines also has uh, this important part about how we have to strengthen our focus on sustainability and climate issues in our educational programs and exhibitions and to be more critical in general. This, of course, also corresponds with the ICOM resolution, uh, saying that museums, as trusted sources of knowledge, are invaluable resources for engaging communities to create a sustainable future for all. 
As uh, the guide says, we have chosen an environmental ambassador, and she, Guru, um, has the daily follow-up of the guide as a daily routine. Uh, and she shared um, this extra responsibility with Verne uh, Ombude, our safety ombud. It is also a sentence here saying that milieu guidance is going to be a theme on our meeting for the whole organization once a month. But we are not happy with that. It was too rare. Uh, so now it's one of the fixed themes in our weekly meeting that is mandatory for all in the museum. This is Monday morning and first it's hello and good morning. Then it's the HMS, the health and uh, safety thing. And then the word goes to uh, the environmental ambassador. So once a week, the guidelines are on the agenda. Um, and of course, even if the ambassador has a certain role, uh, it is a responsibility for everybody in the museum to follow up the guidelines. An important part of it all is to see if we succeed. So uh, when the year is over, uh, the ambassador is responsible for making a good report about how we have worked regarding the guidelines. Uh, the one for 2020 was the first one. We had done quite well uh, and the conclusions was included in the museum's main annual report. Now back to the paragraph about how we deal with sustainability and climate as a theme. And I will show you four examples. Uh, as I mentioned, in all our work with hydropower uh, history, the conflict between the protection of nature and the exploitation of nature is an important theme. Uh, here are some parts uh, uh, of our new exhibition called Norwegian Hydropower. If we look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, this theme is uh, on one hand linked to, to goals talking about ensuring of the mountain ecosystems and protection of biodiversity and natural habitats. Uh, on the other hand, uh, goals talking about clean energy and climate action. And here is Kraftlande, a new digital platform Kraftmuseum has developed together with Skogmuseum, the Norwegian Forest Museum, and NVE, the Norwegian Water Resources and uh, Energy Directorate. In the first episode, um, Kraftlund, it's, it's a very new thing. It's just a few months since we um, published it uh, for the audience. And in the first episode about glaciers, we look at how these ice wanderers can teach us a lot about global warming. And they are very useful climate indicators. Um, and now we are working with um, an episode about wind energy. Um, highly debated uh, theme in Norway the last years, as you know. Uh, so this is very exciting to work with, uh, very challenging and very meaningful. One thing is to address important issues um, in exhibitions and on websites. Uh, a different, a different and, and often more valuable uh, thing is to work together with the audience, um, to have a dialogue with the audience, uh, and not at least young people. Uh, together with the national organization Ungt Entrepreneurskap, Young Entrepreneurship, we run the teaching program Smarter Technology, Smarter Technology, previous called Smarter Energy. Uh, this is for Ungdom School, Junior High School in Westland County, between 1500 and 2000 pupils taking part every year in a competition where these young people try to solve specific issues in local businesses to get it more sustainable. Technology is the means, but the goal is good and sustainable societies to live in. The program meets interdisciplinary goals in the school curriculum with sustainability and democracy as keywords. And here you see some happy pupils who have won their local competition with a vision of environmental friendly transport of tourists and hydrogen uh, production. An important message in the um, uh, program is that the technological uh, solutions we need, um, they are not a uh, magical invention that is uh, invented uh, far away. It's something everybody can take part in. So it's a call for action. And last, some glimpses from a very inspiring project we did last year. 
um, in the school project uh, Demokrati på prøve, Democracy on Trial, we used the Alta conflict in the 1980s as a case. This is, I guess, the main reference case uh, when it comes to environmental conflict in Norway, and it has also an aspect of uh, indigenous people rights, where the Sami fought against the planned hydropower plant in the Alta Canyon, together with many others. In our school project for Ungdomsskolen, um, uh, 14, 15 year old kids, uh, we used the digital exhibition The Battle of Alta as a resort and moved the conflict in time. So now it was The Battle of Alta 2020. Through a role play, the pupils got acquainted with the various uh, perspectives in the conflict and looked at how they, as young people, could influence, take part, make a difference. We talked about how civil uh, disobedience, civil uh, ulidiet, is an important part of uh, democracy. We talked about how democracy works and how it also often fails. And it, it was easy to transfer the mechanisms and actions we played with in the Alta situation to the pupils' uh, uh, lives here and now, uh, to all our lives. Uh, the project lasted for three weeks, several school classes every day. Uh, it was brilliant weeks. Uh, uh, it was in the spirit of the ICOM resolution, I would say. <laughs> So, in different ways, um, we try in Kraftmuseet to make sustainability to be a central part uh, in our museum, uh, something we care about uh, in different ways in the daily museum life and uh, in our plans. We have not made uh, revolutionary changes, um, we are not fantastic, that's not why uh, uh, I talk about it. Uh, here, um, but I think we move in the right direction. We talk a lot about it uh, in the uh, museum, that's uh, something, and it's important. Uh, but it's also uh, some action. Thank you. Thank you, Knut. Inspiring. Uh, our final speaker is Sigurd Nielsen. He wrote his master's thesis in human geography in 2006 entitled Negotiating Nature on Display, Discourse and Ideology, Ideology in Natural History Museums. <clears throat> Since then, he's held full-time positions in different cultural history museums in Southeast Norway with emphasis on education, documentation and dissemination. Today, he's employed as a senior curator at the Anno Museum in Glomdals Museum with an emphasis on documentation, dissemination, and research related to cultural diversity and intangible heritage. He's also a research coordinator for Anno Museum, where he's currently leading a research project focusing on folk museums in diverse societies and visitors' experiences with difference and belonging. Sigurd defended his doctor, his PhD thesis uh, at the Department of Geography, NTNU, in 2019. It was entitled Developing Global Awareness Among Young Students study of students experiences with the exhibition a world at stake in the presentation sigurd will expand on some of the findings from this work the floor is yours sigurd. first i would like to thank the organizers of the conference uh, for inviting me to this uh, session i am especially delighted because i am allowed to speak both as a museum practitioner and geographer about some of the topics that engages me the most, which concerns how museums can be more attentive to critical issues like poverty and injustices. And parallel to this, I am concerned with how museums see their responsibilities in a larger globalized world. I believe that museums, just like any other institution or individual, are deeply embedded in highly globalized world through internet, migration, international trade, and consumption of media. So we all operate in a local environment, but we are not isolated from the larger world. And because we are global and local at the same time, 
we have a moral obligation as institutions to care for the bigger picture in our daily work. But this is not necessarily easy or straightforward. In this talk, I will focus on one exhibition in particular, the one you see in this picture, A World at Stake, which I hope can serve as a peculiar and perhaps controversial example of how museums may communicate a topic like global poverty to its audiences. This presentation is based on research um, I did as a PhD candidate. The project was interdisciplinary, combining literature from both museum studies and cultural and political geography. I was focusing on students' experiences in rather great detail and how they could relate to developing global awareness. I did both quantitative and qualitative interviews, so very different methods and ways of understanding. Overall, I was motivated to discuss museums' potential in addressing global challenges and contribute to global awareness. An important inspiration for this exhibition was the Millennium Development Goals which was launched by the United Nations in 2000 and ended in 2015, when it was replaced by today's Sustainable Development Goals. These goals committed members of, of the United Nations to reduce extreme poverty through eight time-bound targets. The first represented the most important to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. And the other seven goals were means to achieve this goal. For countries in the global north, like Norway, this was primarily a campaign to raise awareness on the issue of global poverty. For low-income countries in the global south, where most of the extreme poverty takes place, the, go the goals was a monitoring system with no less than 64 indicators. With statistics reported annually from each country, it was possible to monitor the progress. As you know, extreme poverty is still a challenge in many parts of the world, but the proportion of world's population living in extreme poverty is declining. These goals were criticized for reducing countries in the global south to problem areas and for not addressing enough responsibility to its wealthier counterpart, the global north, such as Norway. And to some extent, this critique has been addressed in the current Sustainable Development Goals, putting even more emphasis on countries like ours. A World at Stake was launched in 2009 by Experimentarium and Jade Museum, and displayed in four museums in Scandinavia. It was experienced by over 15,000 school and leisure time visits. But rather than displaying the Millennium Development Goals per se, the exhibition took a much more conceptual and experimental approach. In essence, a world at stake invited classes of young students to participate as game pieces and solve hands-on tasks on game board surface, spread out over 250 square meters. This primary event lasted in total one hour. It started with 20 minutes of instructions, where the museum educator introduced pupils to the theme, explained the game rules, and importantly, went through each of the 12 tasks. Focus was on how they require collaborative efforts to be solved and some clues to the different issues at stake in reducing poverty. The sequence was followed by 20 minutes of playing the exhibition, and this is where the students went more in-depth of the 12 specific tasks, all of which drew on themes from the Millennium Development Goals and related to global poverty and inequality. And here you see um, students engaged in about half of the game board. This was followed by a 20 minute summary where the educator discussed each of the team's efforts. 
uh, related to four key issues from the Millennium Development Goals. What is extreme poverty, access to clean water, access to basic, basic health services, and access to education, which you see in this picture. To so take the critical perspectives first, the exhibition was to a large extent based on dualisms. It was the rich and fortunate countries versus the poor and unfortunate countries, and nothing in between. If you were fortunate, you would end up in a rich country, and if you were unfortunate, you would end up in a poor country, as if people are only joyful in rich, in, um, joyful in rich countries and only miserable in poor countries. So, so there was a generalized approach to poverty, where Africa is illustrated by a crisis and a lack of resources. And me, me and the co-author Jürgen Klein uh, elaborate on these issues in the book chapter. And this is the sort of critique which is very potent when looking at the exhibition's photographs and texts from a distance. But I think the effects of an exhibition like this needs to consider the engagement of its visitors. Certainly, this exhibition is complete, incomplete without its participants. It was designed to be played and designed to be experienced as an intense time-limited event, making children and young students an integral part of the content. And this opens up looking at how meaning is negotiated through, for example, the dimensions of affects and emotions. In my conversations with some of the children participating, I asked them to describe um, what they had experienced and whether they perceived it as play or learning. They describe a state of play characterized by focus and constant activity. They are facing challenges, taking on tasks, returning to the dice, and then hurling themselves to the next challenge, mobilizing new skills and efforts. The intensity is maintained by time limits, but also through their own drive to explore more of the exhibition and more of what is not yet known. The way we did it at the museum gets you more involved. You sort of sense that you get more engaged in the theme as opposed to sitting in front of a desk. You put yourself in the situation of the game instead of sitting at the desk and where everything is dropped down on your head. If you're sitting and reading, you might be losing focus and don't get everything. But when you have to do something, you don't lose focus that easily. It is easier to learn. Part of this engagement is due to children's sense of being caught up in an amusing setting. But they also saw its relevance to the real world. My conversation shows that many were perfectly able to differ between playing for having fun, just to score points, and playing in terms of learning, and the fact that the exhibition gave some key ideas into alleviating poverty in the real world. And what is really important to, to grasp is how the exhibition mobilized our imaginations about poor people in other parts of the world. They worked as a driving element in the exhibition, but in many cases, the participants found themselves cast in temporary situations as the poor or as the rich. Sarah, who had experiences with migration herself, said, I have experienced a lot. I have seen what happens to people in the world, but I didn't know they were so... I never had to find food from the garbage bin. I could never imagine anyone had to do that. So then I realized how inequality plays out for some people. And this points to a concept of imaginative geographies, which really is about how we all construct ideas about people in other parts of the world. These ideas are based on often fragments from media, films, images, and stories to make up repertoires, 
which are in part real and in part constructions. Some of them are true, some of them are not true. But we use these repertoires to interpret new experiences and change old repertoires. On one side, this shows how a world at stake makes us negotiate our ideas about, for example, poverty and poor people. On the other side, I think participation in a world at stake was not so much about taking part in the exhibition as it was made by the museum, as it was about performing and co-producing. And I think the really powerful effects was through the experiences that students uh, made themselves through observing oneself, members of your own team and other classmates. And how does this relate to global awareness? Global awareness is a concept that is related to similar terms like citizenship and cosmopolitanism and is connected to huge amounts of literature within the social sciences and humanities. But not many discusses global awareness and museums. Global awareness is usually ascribed to Robert Hanvey, who in the 70s urged a more global perspective in school education and has later been in integrated in curriculum in, in America, United Kingdom and Canada. Merrifield defined it as habits of the mind that foster knowledge, interest and engagement in global issues, local global connections and diverse cultures. And Katie Holden says that global awareness suits well with the aims of the United Nations, which is to st stimulate more knowledge about global issues among the general public. So global awareness is an ability that most people have to seek information about the world, but one in which can be improved over time. The world is complex. It is not easy to understand what actually happens with people and places hundreds of miles away. We often depend on media stories, for example. There are no easy way answers to make a better world or how to perform ideally as a global citizen. So we have to rely on that people make the right decisions based on an informed understanding of the world. A world at stake has its obvious limits. It was a very short event over a very big topic. But my conversations with children indicate that many understood it as something more than just a game and a fun experiences. They understood the normative and political message of the exhibition. The world is at stake and how can we improve conditions for the global populations? This experience triggered students' affects and emotions and students co-produced this experience significantly. They negotiated the exhibition content in relation to their own lives, including preconceived ideas about the world. And elsewhere, I have argued that experiences of mastery stimulated a curiosity to, to know more about global poverty and development. But I don't suggest that this is the best exhibition in the world, but it was significant and it was important. I don't think any exhibition about global poverty could go uncriticized. If you're dis discussing ways to alleviate poverty and a more just distribution of resources around the world, you have to talk about different approaches to development and different ways to, to so-called sustainable development. These are complex issues which are discussed and theorized at the highest levels. So for children and young students, it is a question of how do you start your journey in comprehending these complex issues. Stimulating curiosity to know more is one of the options we can consider. But I really think that museums could address global perspective to a much larger extent, also without changing their core values or their mission statement. The recommendations I mentioned here point to museums' communication to the public, like exhibitions and other initiatives. 
So each museum needs to address something which is specific and hopefully much more limited and targeted than a world at stake. I think we need to recognize audiences' prior knowledge towards global perspectives. In the case of children, <clears throat> children and young students, they are in the process of getting to know the world and finding their place in it. But we have to take into account that they already have ideas about the large world and a sense of global awareness to a certain extent. These ideas may seem simplistic and it can be tempting to play the educated adult and provide fixed solutions to what the world needs. But the world is in constant change. It is complex and it's easy to get overwhelmed by all the trouble. And every young adult is relying on making up their own mind at some point about what the world is and what it needs. So one approach would be to stimulate especially young students' abilities to seek more information and the curiosity to understand the world, enhancing their global awareness, so to speak. The last two recommendations points to how the world has never been completely local. Global trade, resource exploitation and cultural exchange are a part of every nation's history. And historical development in Norway has never been confined to the borders of our territory. So most museums can use their ex uh, current ex collections and exhibitions to, to highlight some of the historical relations across countries and territories and draw parallels to, for example, the sustainable development goals and the challenges that Norway and the world share today. Peasant society was depending and adjusting to weather and climate 200 years ago. And how are peasants in our local communities today adjusting to a change in climate? In the case of poverty, which is one of the core issues of the sustainable development, on the time of Napoleon, 80% of the world population was poor, including people in Norway. So can we use this local history of poverty in Norway to start a discussion for how to alleviate poverty in other parts of the world today? Thank you.